young teenager, my brother and I were walking out of the grocery store, and we were stopped before we got out the door by a loss prevention officer who said, where are those baseball cards? And I said, we put them back. So I love to collect baseball cards, and we had gone into the store, and I had picked up three or four packs of baseball cards, and, and I couldn't, I had a difficult time making a decision on whether I was going to purchase these packs of cards or not. So we probably uh, guiltily looking, walked around the store aimlessly as I poured over whether I was going to purchase these cards or not. I decided not to purchase them, so instead of doing what I should have done and go back to the baseball card section and place them back in the container I got them, I decided it'd be a lot easier if I just dropped them off probably near the flower. I decided I didn't want them, so we started to walk out the door, and the officer said, where are those baseball cards? And I said, uh, I, pu I, I put them back. I was nervous. Now, I really did put them back, and it didn't take long before I was able to take him to the flower and sheepishly tell him I was too lazy to walk a couple aisles over and put them back where they really went. But I was being accused of something. And I felt that accusation, and I, 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 I can understand that it probably looked at the time like I was really guilty. We're going to watch a video here of some kids who try to hide their guilt as well. How did the marker get on your face? Um, Who put it on your face? Um, Daddy. Daddy put it on your face? Yeah, Daddy. And who put the toothpaste on your face? Daddy. Oh, Daddy did that too. I think it was you. No, Daddy. No, who drew on Mommy's mirror? I don't know. Was it you? No. Who was it? Did you eat hot chocolate? Can you tell me lies? What's on your face? What's on your face? Um, uh, sauce. What sort of sauce? Um, black sauce. How do I pocket crack? What? How do I pocket crack? Michael, you broke my iPod. John, what are you eating? You didn't eat anything. Yeah. John, can you explain to me why, why the sprinkles are empty? Did you eat those sprinkles? No. I did not. Yeah, sprinkles. John, mm -hmm. you have sprinkles on your face. Mm -hmm. did, um, no. No. Have you ever been accused of something? Have you ever been accused of something and it's really difficult to prove your innocence when the, the, the proof against you is fairly conspicuous like these kids? Did you eat the sprinkles? No, I didn't eat the sprinkles. Why would you think I ate the sprinkles? Well, because the sprinkles are all over your face. And in today's passage in Matthew, we're going to look at someone, a couple of people actually, who were probably accused. And not only were they accused, the, the, uh, the proof against them was pretty hard for them to explain. And kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, you're going to have an opportunity to pour through this story as well uh, with Pastor Alyssa and some other leaders. And we are going to invite you kids at this time, if you're interested and willing, uh, to stand. And we would like to bless you as you go to kids' worship this morning. So just stand where you're at. And uh, adults, if you're close to them, maybe lay a hand on them as we bless them. Let's say this together. 
May the Lord bless and keep you as you praise him, grow in his image, respond to him in obedient, bold love, discover your place in his story, and build lifelong friendships. May you know the love of Jesus, your Savior, King, and friend. And then kids, will you bless us for our time as you dismiss? May the Lord keep you as you worship him, grow in grace, and respond in obedient, bold love. Thank you, kids. You may go now to kids' worship right over to this door. And uh, parents, guardians, grandparents, whoever you are, are here with us this morning, if this is your first time or your kids have never gone before, as you can tell, they're going this way. And they're going out that door, and after the service is over, and this would be a good reminder to our regulars as well, um, if, if we could pick up our kids in, in a fairly timely manner, uh, that would really help out our kids' ministry volunteers. Someone's not interested in going. Well, in our passage today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 1. And in this passage today, we, we find this cast of characters, and they come together to play important roles in this, this story, this nativity scene. But this story, this plot is actually probably more fit for a Jerry Springer show than for the Bible. There's a pregnancy, and there's debate over who the father is, there's scandal, there's finger pointing, there's gossip, and there's life-altering consequences. See, Mary and Joseph are, are caught up in this chaotic situation, and they have to answer for their perceived actions in the court of public opinion. They both have some explaining to do. And the question is, will they allow those perceptions and those accusations of others to stifle their place, their calling in the midst of God's story, or will they heed the call of the Creator to help bring about a Savior? Now, if I had a really deep voice, I could have done that like, like a movie trailer. That would have sounded really good, right? In our passage today. We find a cast of characters who come together. Okay, I'll stop now. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Will you stand with me as we read from God's Word? Starting in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Now, as we talked about in our Sunday school class, this is not Luke's narrative. 
See, there are, no, there are no angels hovering around, wings flapping, lights on them, making pretty announcements. They're not singing in the sky to peaceful shepherds in a field. There's no halos sitting over Mary's head. See, this isn't the, the pure and the, and the holy and the, and the clean nativity scene that we see all over this time of year. What we read here is a messy, chaotic, difficult, awkward situation. We have unwed Mary walking around with a, with a little baby bump. She's pregnant. And we have Joseph who's considering a divorce. See, this is real life. And real life involves difficult decisions. And in this situation, it, it involves destroyed reputations. It probably involves rumors. It involves hardships. It involves people all around whispering, what's going on here? Did you see? Is she, do you think she's pregnant? What, why don't you ask her? Oh, no, I'm not going to ask her that. Maybe she just had a little too much to eat. No, I think she's pregnant. These rumors, these whispers are most likely going around. It's ugly. It's messy. It's hard. But see, the beginning of this passage says that this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. There's a story to be told. And that story includes this cast of characters who at first glance appear unfit to bring the Savior of the world into the world. But there must be something about the way the story ends. See, when a story ends really well, people usually want to know, well, how did this start? If a business person is, is successful and they've grown their business, people want to ask them, how, how did you start? What, what were the first steps that you took? What did you do? I want to know the beginning of the story. I want to know how this came about. If anyone in any walk of life is successful in any way, most people want to know, how did you get started? What did you do? And I can, I can hear the author here. I can hear Matthew going, this story ends so well, but I've got to tell you how this story came about. Because if you don't know how it started, if you don't know everything it took to get through it, you can't fully appreciate the Messiah himself. So let's dive into this story. Let's see how the birth of the Messiah came about. Kids, teens, did you know that your parents had a life before you? Did you know that? Yeah, and I'm not saying they have no life now, right? I'm not saying that, but I'm, I'm, always, I'm always blown away. Like, I can't fathom that my own parents actually lived before I lived, right? Like, there was actually things that, that they did and that they enjoyed, and, and then when I came along, I'm the oldest of five. Everything changed. Everything was different. Now, many of us parents are going, I can't remember if I had a life before my kids either, right? You're going, Amy and I will sit around off and we'll go, what did we do before we had kids? I, I don't remember. I, I, I don't remember what it was like not to have kids. And we spent five years without kids before Samuel came along. But, but there actually was something your parents did before you had kids. And, and this is what's happening with, with Mary and Joseph. There's something happening before the Savior is born. And for some reason, Matthew says, you all need to know this. 
You need to understand what it was like, how the Savior came about. We're going to start with Mary and Mary's plight. Now, a plight is a condition, state, or situation, especially an unfavorable or unfortunate one, to find oneself in a sorry plight. Now, I believe Mary, we find out she comes around. Like she, she goes, okay, may it be as you have said. And I believe that from that point, Mary had peace about her situation. But up until that point, her question, and I believe it's a question she probably lived with for a while, was how will this be? Since I'm a virgin, how's this going to be, God? And we, we hear in, our sto- in, in, in that story, we, we hear this, like, this, some disbelief. Some how can this be? How will this be? So, so Mary is pledged to be married to Joseph. Verse 18 says, His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, something we need to understand is back in those days, an engagement was very similar to a marriage today. Lawfully, they were connected to one another. They were required by law to be together, and that was sacred, even that engagement. Today, you know, we hear of people that get engaged, and it's kind of like, oh, great. Okay, that's good. That's good. And for the most part, for the most part, we go, oh, so they're going to get married. Some of us probably know people where we go, okay, well, hope that lasts. Hope they make it that far. That wasn't the case here. An engagement was a contract. It was a legal binding contract. Most likely, Joseph had to put forth a sum of money or some of his property to Mary's family. And they made an agreement. I know this doesn't sound very romantic. But they would have made an agreement where Mary's parents said, okay, we'll go along with this. We'll sign on the dotted line. That's how important an engagement was. So when we hear that Joseph was contemplating divorce, one of our first questions is, but they weren't married. What do you mean? You had to legally divorce in order to get out of an engagement. They were bound by law. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant. And now the words here, found to be, before they came together, came together doesn't mean they just came in proximity of one another and held hands. Before they did the thing that's required to have a baby. That's what came together means. Before that happened, she was found to be pregnant, says verse 18. Now, Joseph knew it wasn't his. He knew it. Because they hadn't come together yet. Joseph had an understanding of how things work. Mary had an understanding of how things work. Most likely, the people around them, the community, had a fairly good understanding of how things worked. So there were only a few plausible explanations. Either Mary had an affair, or perhaps she was a victim of a rape, or perhaps she was involved in some sort of prostitution. None of those things were good things. In fact, they were all grounds for her to be publicly stoned. In fact, her just simply being pregnant regardless of the manner by which that occurred would have been grounds for public stoning. 
So you see Mary's plight. She's been told that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And everyone around her, including Joseph himself, is going, wait a second. Uh Uh-uh. I know how this works. We know how this goes. There's something not quite right about this story. So Mary finds herself in an extremely difficult situation. Then we have Joseph. Let's look at Joseph because really this passage is mainly focused on Joseph. See, Joseph is in a predicament. He's in quite the predicament. A predicament is an unpleasantly difficult, perplexing, or dangerous situation. A class or category of logical or philosophical predication. Definitely unpleasant was Joseph's situation. Definitely difficult. Definitely perplexing. Definitely dangerous. Let's talk about his predicament. See, Joseph had a fairly easy way out of this if he wanted to exercise that easy way out. I told you that Joseph probably gave a sum of money or or gave some of his property. If he could prove that Mary and the baby she was pregnant with was not his, he could very easily go, not mine, go to trial. It gets figured out in the divorce trial. He could get all of his money and property back and he could wipe his hands clean of this. I'm guessing Joseph was going, huh, that might not sound too bad. I would even say a man in Joseph's similar situation was probably saying that. But we learned that that's Not what Joseph was doing. Joseph also had a reputation. Joseph had a career. He had a job. He he built things. He was a carpenter. He had a reputation to uphold in the community. And if he took Mary to trial and some infidelity was found, he could easily save face in public. Again, he could wipe his hands clean of this and say, this is her. And everybody probably would have believed him. But see, Joseph had a predicament. Verse 19 says this, because Joseph, her husband, Mary's husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. So Joseph was a man of the law. Joseph was a man who followed the law, who said, this is what the law is and I'm going to follow it. So his predicament is this. The law says Someone in his situation should divorce. So this would have been, in in Joseph's mind, to divorce her would not have been a bad thing. That would have actually been a very noble thing because he would have been following the law. But see, Joseph's heart was telling him something different. I believe Joseph, when Mary came and approached him, I believe that Joseph did not go, woman, you are full of it. I think Joseph went, this doesn't make sense. I can't fathom how this is a possibility, but I know this God that you know. And I know that he works in ways that we don't always understand. So I believe that Joseph had this glimmer of not only wanting to believe her because of who she was, but wanting to believe her because he knows how God works. So Joseph's in a predicament. Do I follow the law and divorce? Or do I follow 
my heart. He decided to follow his heart, not in the way of following God, but in protecting Mary. See, instead, Joseph saves Mary by choosing the least damaging path for her. A quiet divorce. See, if he could divorce her quietly, he could follow the law and protect her to a certain extent. See, if, if he did it quietly, now he could release the penalty from her because now she wouldn't have been married. Now she would just be pregnant with an illegitimate child but would not have committed adultery. So she may not be stoned. She may be able to go back with her parents and live there secretly or quietly. She probably is still going to have to deal with ridicule and people going, whoa, what happened here? But she would still be alive. So Joseph chooses not what's best for him, but what was best for Mary. Chances are they hadn't had time to really fall in love at this point. Chances are this was just kind of a, yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, that sounds good. Parents going, yeah, okay, this should work. Joseph didn't owe her a thing. He made the decision that was best for Mary. It's interesting, just a little side note, I guess, that God trusted Joseph to be the earthly father of his own son. And I think we're starting to see why. Here's a man who didn't have to, but did what was best for someone else. I wonder if perhaps Joseph had a role in teaching that life lesson to Jesus himself that perhaps doing what's best for someone else at the risk of your own life may have been a good precursor to what Jesus would come to do. So we have Mary's plight and we have Joseph's predicament, but then comes the angel's proclamation. A proclamation is something that is proclaimed. A public and official announcement. Now, I don't think this announcement was very public. It sounds as if perhaps Joseph was the only recipient of this proclamation because it actually takes place in a dream. But in the midst of this mess, in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this difficulty, this, this plight, this predicament, an angel of God shows up and says, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. In this dream, the angel says yes. What Mary probably likely had told you already, I'm confirming that the baby is conceived by the Holy Spirit. And I have to wonder if Joseph's response was celebratory. As a human, I, I, I think, 
perhaps he may have wanted to go, oh. But as a follower of God, I'm guessing Joseph felt relief and he felt excitement and he felt anticipation as he saw the story of God, as he saw the story of the Messiah unfolding before his eyes. See, Joseph knew the prophecies. Joseph knew what the Old Testament said. And I wonder if in that moment he went, yes, yes. The angel tells Joseph, don't divorce her, but take her home as your wife. And then the angel says, you're to name him Jesus and you're to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Name him this because this is what he's going to do. Yet more confirmation that in the midst of this chaos, in the midst of this mess, God says, Joseph, I want you to be a part of this. And it's going to work out well. This is the one who's going to save these people from their sins. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. See, God knows this is a chaotic situation. God knows this. God's not, he's not going, oh, this, ah, this, this will be fine. No, this will be easy. God knows this is chaos. God knows that, that the situation that Mary and Joseph and, and, and even Jesus are, are in, he knows this is a mess. He gets it. He knows it doesn't look right to others. He knows others are going to look at it and go, that doesn't make sense. He knows that Mary and Joseph are placed in the middle of this. But see, God gets it. God gets it. He understands the mess they're in. And even God himself still chooses to send his own son into this mess. See, they're, they're not getting any sympathy from God. God goes, I know it's a mess. He's my son. I know what I'm sending him into. I know what this looks like. I know this isn't going to be easy for him. I know that, that ultimately, years down the road, it's not going to end comfortably for him. But yet, in the midst of the mess, God sends his one and only son. So God sends this angel to assure them that the result will be worth it that they will bring the Messiah into the world, that they will help usher in the kingdom of God, and that, and that Jesus will save his people from their sins. And not only this, see, that's good news, but he says, and people will call him Emmanuel because he's going to be God with you, God with us. See, it's not just there's chaos and there's mess and, and, and don't worry, I'm going to send Jesus to take care of everything. But don't worry, I'm going to send Jesus to take care of everything and he's going to be with you. He's not just going to just come in and go, don't worry, I got this, I'll fix this. No, he's going he's gonna to be with us. Emmanuel, God with us. And then we see Joseph's faith once more. Joseph wakes up from this dream. And it says he did what the Lord commanded. As simple as that. He got up. He woke up. And he did what the Lord commanded. See, Jesus entered the world in the midst of chaos. 
The king of kings does not show up in, in a royal lineage. He doesn't, he doesn't show up in a, in a palace and he doesn't, he doesn't show up in, in, in this, this lineage of, oh, there's a king and there's a king and there's a king and there's, oh, and there's Jesus. But he enters our world through ordinary people called to extraordinary things. Now, we may look at Joseph and Mary and say, what was so extraordinary about that? Well, that's a human way of looking at it. A teenage girl and a carpenter. See, God's definition of extraordinary is way different than ours. What was extraordinary was their character and was their faith. He enters our world through ordinary people called to extraordinary things. So here's the question today. This is an exciting week. This is an exciting week for most of us. There's anticipation. There's love. There's joy. There's hope. There's peace. It's December 22nd. I love Christmas Day. I'm excited. I'm anticipating. But we can't miss the reason that we're really all here. I don't mean here. I mean here. How will you help bring Jesus into the world this Advent season? I'm fully aware that this world doesn't seem like a field ripe for the coming Messiah, but it's not how he came the first time. And it's probably not how he's going to return the second time. He's going to come into a world of chaos, of mess. How will you help bring Jesus? How will you help bring the Messiah into the world this Advent season?